We start with a point. Molecules of a meditation, remote viewing, noatropics, miracles of my super learning, the physiology of trauma, ESI. Morphogenic resonance, heart intelligence, theater of the mind, accelerating the evolution of human consciousness. Brought to you by BrainSync.com. CDs and MP3 downloads for peak performance at BrainSync.com. Welcome to Theater of the Mind, live at 5. Your host, Kelly Howell. I've got a great show for you today with Rob Bryanton author of Imagining the Tenth Dimension. Rob's book and video, which you can watch online, presents a unique model of the universe that fills in the gaps where science has left off. He's a prolific writer, blogger, video blogger, and a songwriter. Rob will be answering your questions today. The call-in number is 1-877-230-330. 3062. Apparently, that number is supposed to work from anywhere in the world. And I'm giving away free brain sync CDs to callers with questions for Rob. Again, the call in number is 1 877 230 3062. Hi, Rob. Welcome to the show. Hello, Kelly. It's a great honor to be here. Oh, it's an honor to have you. Thank you for taking a break from all your songwriting and video blogging and all the things that you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you say we uh, start with an overview of your project and how you came to create it? Oh, how far back do you want to go? Well, <laughs> I, I don't know. To... How far back does it go? <laughs> for me, it goes back to when I was seven. And mm-hmm. basically it happened at the end of a school year as I was running through a field wanting to tell my next-door neighbor about my report card, and my foot dropped into a gopher hole. And at that moment, uh, this is something a lot of people have experienced, the reality seemed to shift. It was like that wrenching down that happened there caused the entire sky to tilt, and for a moment I was completely disoriented. And it just felt extremely important to me when I was thinking about that to uh, Minutes later, days later, months later, and I kept trying to think what might have happened at that point. And it started to occur to me that perhaps what had happened at that point was a splitting apart where there were different universes where some I had fallen and broken my leg or hurt myself worse or somewhere I had missed the gopher hole entirely. And I happened to be lucky enough to be in one of the universes where none of the really bad things had happened to me. Uh, The following year, I read a book called A Wrinkle in Time. Are you familiar with it? Oh, sure. Sure. So A Wrinkle in Time is is such a great way to introduce yourself to starting to think about some of the big picture ideas that we're talking about here. And there's a a little uh, metaphor that they present in that book where they have a string and they're holding the string out taut and you're imagining an ant walking on the string. And then they say, what if you wanted to get that string and to be able to be on a different part of the string more quickly. All you have to do is bring the string closer together, and suddenly the ant is going to be able to jump from one position to another. And in a wrinkle in time, that's how they present the idea that it's possible to also fold time. So a lot of people who are familiar with the animation that uh, has become so popular on the Internet that shows my ideas recognize that folding as being something that comes from a wrinkle in time. But even that goes much further back to something that comes from a book written way back in 1884 by a fellow named Edwin Abbott called Flatland, A Romance of Many Dimensions. And in that that book, he presents the story of two-dimensional flatlanders who are living in a two-dimensional world and what happens when a three-dimensional sphere starts to interact with them. And uh, so all of those ideas are sort of the basic core of some of the things that are presented in this animation that uh, is called Imagining the Tenth Dimension that has uh, become such a hit all over the, the, the world right now. It's been translated into ten different languages and viewed millions and millions of times on different uh, video blogging sites or video uh, 
streaming sites. And uh, yeah, it's just been an amazing experience. <laughs> it's a brilliant video. For people who haven't seen it, is it is it possible for you to give us a brief tour through the ten dimensions without the video tool? Well, it's definitely it's a visualization that's easier if you have pictures. But uh, you know, for me, this is an idea I came up with in the '80s, and so I spent a couple of decades there just drawing this presentation on napkins to anybody who would listen to me and and uh, talking through it over and over, and you know, some people would get it and. Some people would go, that's, that's bonkers, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. And uh, so by the time uh, I decided that I was going to create the animation, I had talked through this animation, the concepts of it, so many times that the, that I had a fairly concise way to, to present it. But it really does work better if you have visuals. Yeah, uh, it's a sure, great video. Try. Well, we could even, we could just sort of, we could start after the third since I think most people are <laughs> well, sure, familiar with the first, the, first second, and third. And, third. and uh, a lot of people are familiar with the fourth dimension being time. But uh, in my uh, presentation, I try to discourage people from using the word time because it has so many different meanings. You can say, I'm going to meet you at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. That's a specific position in time. You can say, I'm going to meet you two days from now. That's, uh, that's thinking of time as a, an expanse. But it always tends to be in the uh, thermodynamic version of time, which is time only has one direction. So what I try to encourage people to think of is that the fourth dimension is not time, it's duration. In the same way that uh, the third dimension can be thought of as being combined from length, width, and height, uh, the fourth dimension, if you call it duration, that gives you a better way of thinking about how, even though we experience time in only one direction, many, many physicists over the last hundred years have tried to find ways to convey to people that there are timeless ways of viewing reality, of viewing reality as being something that occurs outside of our space-time. Albert Einstein was one of my my favorites. Uh, you know, there's so many phrases. He's, he's famous... Uh, for saying that convey this idea of timelessness, you know, he, he says um, uh, the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. That's one of the things he says. I came across a nice one this morning that uh, he says, time and space are modes by which we think and not conditions in which we live, which... <laughs> I think there's a little bit of a mind-blowing moment just in that thought right there. Yeah, I remember my uh, first hearing about all time being simultaneous, Mm -hmm. and that kind of blew my mind. Um, Just the concept that the past, present, and future are all happening right now. Yeah. In some other dimension, in the fourth dimension, or the fifth dimension, or where? Well, the... The idea that it happens all in the fourth dimension is fine if you only believe there's one past, one present, one future. And this is where my animation starts to uh, present ideas that not all physicists embrace. But I think by following this line of reasoning, we have a way to start to understand so many other things, uh, uh, quantum entanglement, uh, what's known as uh, Everett's many worlds theory, which, of course, is what I was thinking about, although I didn't know about it back when I was seven, when I was thinking that there were different worlds where I broke my leg or ended up in a wheelchair or, or you know, worse. Uh, that is known as Everett's Many Worlds Interpretation of, of Quantum Mechanics, and it's an accepted uh, explanation for the uh, indeterminacy and superposition that's happening in the quantum world and it takes it out to our physical world around us. So when I say that uh, uh, the fourth dimension really only has room for one past, one present, one future, that works great if you are a hard determinist, uh, if you're familiar with that phrase. You Mm -hmm. know, if you believe that uh, when the Big Bang happened, uh, a series of events were set in motion that are just ticking along like clockwork and... Right now, you and I believe we have free will, but it's all an illusion. It's, uh, it's just a bunch of chemical reactions that are happening in, in our brains that are convincing us that we're making decisions, but whatever decision we make, we were destined to make it already. And that's, 
that's the hard determinist viewpoint. Personally, I'm, I'm not willing to swallow that one. I'm pretty darn convinced I've got free will and that there are ways that I'm choosing from moment to moment to uh, exert my uh, will one way or another. Well, I'm interested in this idea of future self and the selection mm-hmm. process because I, I do feel that we do have infinite possibilities and futures available to us. Absolutely. Uh, but the, the one thing that I try to, to make clear with my project is, uh, although they may feel limitless, there's still obviously a set of uh, uh, futures that you can't get to from here. Right. You know, if, if, if I have a car accident and I lose my leg, I can't just through my free will get to the future where my leg grew back all by itself. So uh, basically, if we're following the line of reasoning of, uh, of my presentation, that's the sixth dimension, which is all the parts of the probability space that we're now looking at through the fifth dimension that are sort of on the, the back side of the buildings. If you, if you think of yourself standing in the middle of a street, there's, uh, there's that street, which is just a line extending out, and that's like the fourth dimension. There's all those side streets, some of which you can look down, some of which you can't, and that's the fifth dimension, the possibilities, the probabilities that you can get to from here. But the sixth dimension is the, the back sides of the buildings, the parts that you can't see from your current location within your probability space. So uh, in my animation, I present the idea of uh, somebody being able to fold the fifth dimension through the sixth dimension to be able to get to a different version of themselves. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's, again, one of the, the concepts that, uh, that people seem to really enjoy about my presentation because it helps to make them understand what the difference is between uh, the, what uh, uh, quantum physicists talk about, which is the idea that there is a version of the universe where you now pop out of existence there in your studio and suddenly reappear on the moon. Well, <laughs> uh, they, they always follow that by saying, but the likelihood of that happening is so small that it would take longer than the life of the universe for such an event to occur. Well, so if we're thinking of this fifth dimensional probability space as being this gigantic sphere of all the things that we can get to, then the sixth dimension, the version where you now reappear on the moon, uh, Lord knows why you'd want to do that right now, but if you did, that would be part of the sixth dimension. And by the time you have the sixth and the fifth and the fourth all uh, together, that's basically kind of like the uh, corresponding version of the three dimensions of space that we know. So uh, in some ways, uh, people like to think of the fourth, fifth, and sixth in my presentation as being the, the moral uh, version of, of uh, reality, the, the, re- the reality that results from choices taken and the choices not taken, which, of course, is the other thing you have to think about. There's a probability space where I put the phone down now and uh, go running down the street naked. I'm choosing <laughs> not to observe that version of reality. So uh, by not observing it, I'm willing to accept that it's there. We all have temptations that uh, are presented to us from moment to moment that uh, we don't act upon. Those are also part of the sixth dimension by our free will, by our choosing not to become part of those realities where we make the, the decisions that aren't as good for us. We're speaking with Rob Bryanton, author of Imagining the Tenth Dimension. If you've got questions for Rob, the call-in number is one 877 I'm giving away free CDs to all callers with questions. Hey, Rob. You did a uh, a survey on your website um, asking, "Is time moving faster?" And I love the question, and I'm I'm real curious: Are things really changing, or is this perceived acceleration just some strange side effect of aging? Uh, well, that is really a big question, isn't it? It Personally, is. I think I think there is an acceleration happening, uh, but uh, it. It's kind of one of those relativistic questions. When you're on the on the train that's accelerating accelerating out of the station, uh, it's harder for you to perceive that acceleration than it is for the people who are outside watching the train leave the station. And so there's there's this constant acceleration that uh, that we know is happening uh, in the expansion of the universe and uh, in the the connections that people are seeing to each other right now. 
I think they're all very connected to each other. I think there is a lot of accelerations that are happening. I think we're all heading towards something that uh, that's going to be very interesting when we get there. And uh, and the idea that that's a, a side effect of aging, uh, I don't really buy myself. I mean, I think uh, I think that acceleration though has been there for a long time. It's just wherever you happen to be on the curve becomes the the version of the universe that you're used to. So somebody who's who's five years old right now, the acceleration that they're experiencing is massively larger than than the acceleration you and I experienced when we were five. But for them, that's their world. That's what they're used to. That's what they're becoming tuned into. Rob, we have a couple of uh, callers on hold here. We have Helen in New Zealand, who who I know wants to speak with you because she emailed in today. (laughs) Helen, welcome to the show. Well, hello. I'm glad you got through. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you great. It's like you're in the room with us. Fantastic. Um, and I want to tell you, Kelly, that I absolutely love your uh, work, and I, I just find it very enriching for my life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so what do you want to ask Rob? He's here. Yes, I'm curious about, I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't quite understand when you experience a split. You said sort of you had an idea, or maybe it spurred the idea when you, when you had that thing happen to you when you were a, a, a kid running. And obviously we're experiencing splits often. Is there any time we can actually kind of know that one is happening to us? How do we know? Personally, I think that, uh, that this is highly related to the construction of memory. Uh, and in fact, that's that's really the difference between the moments when you're just sort of coasting along and not really making a conscious decision and the moments when something uh, happens that sticks with you afterwards. I think those are the splits that uh, really matter. And anybody who's been in a a car accident or one of those moments when they feel like time really slows down, I think is really what's happening there is that there are just so many multiple splits that you're being presented with and are, are making choices from within those instance to instance that uh, your your memory of the event uh, makes it feel like it was a much more slow experience of time. It's because there was all these tiny little cusps that you were going through that you were trying to navigate through to, to make yourself uh, get to whatever you were able to perceive as being the, the best possible outcome from that uh, very difficult moment. And, and may I ask, um, does that mean we're splitting off Infinite, infinite, infinite universes constantly? That's Everett's many world interpretation of quantum mechanics. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it does present the idea, then, that there, there's already a version of you right now who has made the best possible decisions and is living the best possible life 10 years from now. And all you have to do is figure out a way to get there. Well... That's that's why I'm listening to to you guys talk today. <laughs> <laughs> I my mind is going in swirls and spirals and wormholes. So <laughs> Helen, thank you, thank you so much for calling and, and letting me ask my question. I appreciate it. Sure, sure. We've got Dave in San Diego calling. Hi, Kelly. Hey, Dave. How are you? Doing wonderful. Uh, yeah, of course, you were just born to do this. You rock. <laughs> uh, and you have a good guess. Um, I, my question is about when he had that event when he was seven, he could have shrugged and kept on with his life. He didn't. Uh, when that happened, he became a, a sort of a different person, not one of the flock. How did he turn that around into celebrity, uh, you know, instead of being just another minority, you know, freaky little kid? Well, for me, as, as I was saying, I spent decades feeling like this was a really important idea mm-hmm. and uh, wanting to get it out into the world but prior to the internet you know I'm, I'm just a guy out in the middle of the Canadian prairies I don't really have a way to to make the kind of connections that the internet made possible and it was actually a near-death experience that made me decide it's time to stop sitting on this idea that I feel is important and get it out into the world I had a, a surgery uh, um, that went wrong uh, where I almost bled to death on the operating table, and uh, uh, it was the wasn't till the next day that I even woke up, and it took me months to recover from it. But it was even the very next day 
uh, my son was sitting beside the the bed, and and I started to come to, and I wanted to talk to him about these ideas. Uh, uh, you know, feeling like maybe this is the last chance I'm ever going to have to talk to about to anybody about these ideas because I could still pass away at that moment. And thank you uh, for not passing away. <laughs> well, well, thank you for saying so. <laughs> but you know, for me, this is really an expression of a creative um, idea that I, as a creative person, you know, it's the kind of thing I'm trying to do when I'm writing music, when I'm writing, uh, you know, when I'm trying to create anything. And I think that's what art is. You know, you're trying to reflect something that's a personal truth for you. And I think that's what has made this project connect to so many people is because they see something reflected in their own ideas of what is really happening out there, what really the underlying structures are. It connects to people in ways that continually surprise me, that I couldn't have predicted, but I think that's the, that's really, you know, what you're talking about when you're talking about those underlying truths. Awesome. Inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Dave, thanks for calling in. Rob? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I interviewed Nassim Harriman in a previous show, and he said that we're manifesting many black holes within us all the time. Right. What's your take on that? <laughs> well, uh, I am, uh, I'm fascinated by Nassim's work. Uh, he's interesting also because he insists that there are really no dimensions, that we only live in one dimension, and that uh, even the first and second dimension don't really exist. So when he's talking about uh, about mini black holes, what I think he's really, from my perspective, talking about is the fact that we are, from instant to instant, not in this fourth dimensional line, but in one, as they call it, a plank frame or a plunk frame uh, of uh, reality after another in the fifth dimension. And that's a tiny, tiny little point sized reality that it's our window into the probability space of the fifth dimension. And uh, so for me, if, if I'm uh, uh, taking the themes ideas, I would say the one dimension that we are in really is the fifth dimension. And if you're talking about that eternal now that, uh, that so many enlightened individuals like to talk about, that's what they're talking about. The now is in the fifth dimension. And that's what connects to all these other mini black holes, these these uh, other possible universes, the uh, connections that uh, people feel through ideas, and and you know if you want to call it souls or uh, or uh, you know any other metaphysical term that people use to think about how they're connected to each other. I think all that's happening right in the center of uh, all these ten dimensions. It's right at the fifth dimension, which if you draw them out from zero to ten. Five is right in the middle. It's like the the octave harmonic where everything is happening on that string that uh, that is vibrating to create the the reality that's around us. That's interesting. So art, music, telepathy, ideas they are they all reside in the fifth dimension. Well, that's that's our window into them. Uh, you know, a lot of that stuff uh, it can can exist outside the dimensions if you're willing to accept the existence of the additional dimensions. Uh, by the time you get up to the ninth dimension, I think you're to where um, quantum physicists uh, uh, like to say information equals reality. It's where it all it's all just data. It's all just patterns and, and ideas. It's memes, as uh, Richard Dawkins like to call it, uh, uh, where uh, you know there really can't be an expression of of very specific matter up in the ninth dimension, uh, but there can be a preference for one kind of reality over another. You know, uh, if, if uh, you were up in the ninth dimension and you were interested in universes that uh, destructed, uh, flew apart into nothingness right away, then you'd probably want to move away from where we are and uh, being positioned and find uh, versions of, of universes that have a much lower strength of gravity. And uh, so for you as a... Uh, a pattern or a selection choice pattern uh, that's up there, you would then try to to uh, gravitate towards those sorts of of uh, universes instead. Well, we're multi-dimensional beings, right? Absolutely. That's then, what I believe too. And then, how how is it possible for us to perceive these higher dimensions more clearly? 
Well, I think you've uh, given us some really good examples of how people are able to use their mind through meditation practices to be able to connect to their higher self. And uh, I, I think uh, one of the surprising things for me as somebody who has no experience with psychedelics at all is how many people I've been contacted by who have uh, taken various uh, hallucinogens and said, what I saw under the influence of, of you know, X drug, Y drug, is completely explained by your version of, of how the dimensions are connected together. It, it, it all makes sense to me now. <laughs> and, you know, all I can say to somebody like that is, thank you. I have I had no idea that uh, the things that you were seeing were going to be explained by this. But again, if we're talking about the underlying truth of, of our reality, it's not that surprising that uh, the people who go way out there to the edges of perception will be able to, uh, to find things that reflect that underlying truth. So shamanic states, deep, deep Absolutely. meditation, yeah. 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 yeah, and and certainly, you know, I, I I always have to be careful because even though I have no experience with the uh, with psychedelics myself, uh, you know, uh, uh, David John, J. Brown, for instance, is a, a, a noted and respected expert on psychedelics, uh, who's written many books and uh, written articles uh, for Scientific American, and he's a huge fan of my book. Uh, you know, uh, he he calls uh, Imagine of the Tenth Dimension one of the most brilliantly conceived and mind-stretching books that he's ever encountered, you know? <laughs> so, it uh, is. It is. Well, well thank you. <laughs> no doubt about it. We're speaking with Rob Bryanton, author of Imagining the Tenth Dimension. We're going to take a short break. Well, actually, it's not a break. We're going to listen to one of Rob's musical pieces called Tying It All Together. I love that music you wrote, Rob. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Sam, do you want to put that on? It's the age-old question. It always stays the same.
That was Rob Bryanton's music called Tying It All Together. Rob, that was fantastic. I just love that. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, we're, we're taking calls. So if anyone has questions for Rob, the phone number is one 877 3062 and I'm giving away free CDs to all callers with questions. Okay, so while uh, the music was playing, uh, we were having a very interesting conversation about the vacuum, zero-point energy, black holes, and dark matter, because I don't understand what the difference is between them all. Sure. Can you tell us? Well, basically, uh, if you're talking about dark matter, that is what is keeping our universe from flying apart uh, in a way that seems unexplainable. It's, uh, when you look at the, at the universe, you expect it, it to be flying apart more quickly than it is. So there's something there that's pulling it all back together. And uh, in my way of explaining the dimensions, uh, I'm suggesting that that dark matter pull is coming from the other universes that are right around the corner in the fifth dimension that are sort of the universes next door to ours. Is that a parallel uh, universe? Yes, exactly. And that's that's actually a phrase we haven't used yet. When when Everett's uh, many worlds theory is being talked about, that's basically what we're talking about. All this splitting apart is into parallel universes. And uh, that's a different concept, uh, uh, generally speaking, from the multiverse, which is when you get into what I was talking about, if you're up in the ninth dimension, there's a a multiverse landscape that physicists talk about where there's all these different universes that have different basic physical laws. And if you were moving through that multiverse landscape uh, at any particular position, you would find another completely different universe from the one that that we're experiencing. So then you were asking about uh, uh, dark energy and zero-point energy. Zero-point energy. Vacuum energy and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, uh, That is... For the dark energy, that's what's causing our universe to pull apart right now. And uh, so there's this energy that's underlying everything. And uh, so when people are talking about uh, about even out in the vacuum, there's still all this constantly bubbling, burbling energy that's, that's there and that someday maybe we'll figure out a way to, to be able to harvest. And, and some people are suggesting that there's tiny little black holes and maybe even tiny little universes, short-lived universes that are are occurring out there. All of that is really uh, connected to the, the fifth dimension and above in, in my way of imagining things. And uh, the, one, uh, the one thing that uh, I think is really interesting, when people are talking about the forces, uh, they say that gravity is the only force that exerts itself across all of the dimensions, all the extra dimensions. So when you start to talk about the law of attraction and you start to talk about empathy and you start to talk about dark energy that's pulling everything apart, all of that's happening above us. That's in, in a way of thinking where you say the fifth dimension and above is, uh, is where all of that is occurring. I have a whole bunch more questions for you because I, I, I just do. <laughs> what is the jumping Jesus phenomena? <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, an interesting... Uh, idea that was um, put forth. Uh, originally, it comes from an idea by Albert, you know, Alfred Korzybski, the uh, creator of General Semantics, and it's the idea that, uh, that there is uh, a constant doubling of information that, that's happening and that it's at an accelerating pace. And so, um, so I did a blog entry about this, and it <laughs> turned out to be the most popular blog entry of all time that I've uh, I've created so um, uh, futurist uh, Robert Anton Wilson uh, created it. Uh, the the jumping. Oh, I yeah, Anton Wilson. Yeah, with. I remember him. Yeah. So he talks about how if you were to think of all the information that was available in the world in the time of Jesus, then if you were to uh, assign that a value, he said, "Let's call it one Jesus." And then he said, "When you get to the year fifteen hundred, the amount of information available to humans has doubled. So that's two Jesus. And then he keeps going and going through his presentation, and by the time you, you get up to modern times, 
there's doublings happening uh, every year or less, according to some people now. Uh, uh, the, the, the current amount of information that, that, uh, available in the world is doubling about twice a year. Uh, so the, you know, the, uh, the somewhat irreverent term that he uses for it, the, the jumping Jesus phenomenon, is just uh, one of those mental slaps that helps you to remember this, this idea that really is very important. We're, you know, if we're talking about us being on an accelerating curve, that curve is taking off in ways that, uh, that even 20 years ago, you know, would have been completely astonishing to anybody at that time. So there's a connection between the quantity and speed with which we receive information and this time acceleration idea? I would say it all ties together, yeah. Yeah. But I'm, we, that's the way I think. I'm, I'm one of those everything fits together kind of people. I can tell from your video. <laughs> you make it all fit together in your music. Rob, we've got a uh, caller, Silvana in Denver. Hey, Silvana. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Rob. Hello. Welcome um, to the show. Thank you. And Kelly, thank you for all your work. I love it. You're welcome. Um, Rob, I have a question, and I hope I just tuned in. So I hope you haven't talked about this already. Um, when you are in like an out-of-body, you're having an out-of-body experience, what would that um, dimension be? Well, that's uh, that's an interesting question. So if we're talking about uh, you having an out-of-body experience, but you're still experiencing a version of your world that you're in right now, then I would say that's, that's well, in the fifth dimension. But if you're exactly. moving... I think you're, you're, like you're traveling, kind of. Sylvan, Sylvana, could I interject here? I mean, one of the sure. ideas that I talked a lot about with Bill Buhlman is that if we're multidimensional beings, then our consciousness exists in other places simultaneously and that we're uh, identified with our bodies. You know, most of our awareness is focused here and right. so the idea of going out of the body is um, disidentifying or disassociating with our identification with the body. So uh, I guess, Rob, what what we're asking, and I think it's a great question, is where where would we be when we're out of body? Are we visiting other dimensions? There's probably many different levels that we could be accessing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, that, that's why I ask if you're visiting a version of your world that exists now or if you're visiting some world that's, in, you know, not part of our probability space because I think that would that would basically be one of the ways that you could tell. If you're in a fantastical dreamscape, uh, uh, you're definitely, uh, you know, you've moved beyond the limits of our space-time at that point. So you're in the fifth dimension and possibly the sixth dimension and above. So it, uh, it really depends what you're experiencing. My my main interest would be when you do have some sense of this world here, not in a completely different world. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say the the limits of our our fourth dimension space time uh, mm -hmm. don't really allow for those sorts of multiple connections, and so I would say you must be in the fifth dimension by then at least. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, oh, because you're kind of talking about the, uh, what do they call it, the shadow world. It's sort of a shadow of our reality here, but you can move through walls and there are different properties, but things look similar. Is that what you're talking about? Are, so, are you you're, asking, you're me? asking me? Yeah, <laughs> Silvana. Um, I'm talking. I'm talking like when you have an out of body experience and you are yes you're kind of in you're your in your own room world. you're yeah, in, in your, your room. you're in your house exactly but the properties of movement and time are different exactly that. right so right. so, so you that's why I'm suggesting you must be outside of the the limits of of our fourth dimension if you're if you're able to have those sorts of experiences you're connecting to the other parts of you that aren't here in the, the limited little line of time that we're experiencing here in the fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Thank you, Silvana. Okay, well, thank you so much. Great question. Thank you so much. Um, Rob, what are the limits of the fourth dimension? Well, basically, the the fourth dimension and the first dimension are are really analogous to each other. So, if you think about the first first dimension, you can define one point, you can define another point, and then uh, a line can pass through those two points, heading towards infinity in either direction. So, in the same way, the fourth dimension, you could say, here's now. That's, let's call that a point, and let's say an hour from now is another point. There's a line that passes through those two points and extends to infinity in either direction. Uh, but that's, you know, that still uh, doesn't leave a lot of room for all the other things that we've been talking about. And for me, I think it's one of the reasons why, for instance, quantum physics ends up being portrayed as so unimaginable. You know, people talk about entanglement and superposition and and, uh, you know, what Einstein liked to call spooky action at a distance. All right. those things seem impossible from our, our little line of time. You need, you need something more than that. And that, that's uh, why uh, I insist that our now, the, the, what we're experiencing at this moment, is really in the fifth dimension. And uh, strangely enough, Einstein actually embraced that idea, too, that our reality comes from the fifth dimension. But it seems that uh, it's something that just hasn't really made it into mainstream consciousness yet. Yeah, why, why that, aren't people talking about it more? Well, personally, I think part of it is still uh, there's an awful lot of people who prefer to believe that there is uh, only one future, uh, that, that uh, they would like us all to believe that because that leaves us with a little less power. So uh, I think uh, that's why that idea has been suppressed for the last hundred years or so. It was, you know, it's 1919 when that idea was first proposed to uh, Einstein by Kaluza, and uh, it took him a couple years. To, uh, he kind of sat on the idea for a while and said, "Oh man, that, what a that's pretty wacky." I don't know. If this I can changes everything, that doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, but eventually he did. He did accept that. Uh, the fifth dimension is where our reality comes from, and uh, that actually, uh, that idea went in and out of style within uh, uh, advanced physics uh, over the next 80 years, but it, the Kaluza-Klein theory uh, grew from that idea, and that's actually one of the, the core ideas of string theory. So what about the idea of the causal plane? Is that the fifth dimension where we actually visualize and project our, I don't know if we're actually projecting or 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 extracting um, things that we want to, say, manifest in the third dimension. Yeah, if we're, if we're talking about us being able to uh, visualize the, the best possible future, that's part of our fifth dimensional probability space. Uh, but there could still be forces that are, are from above that that are part of the, the you know, the ideas of, of uh, a benevolent force that wants us all of life to do well and all of us to have a best possible future, you know, those those forces could be spread across right up to the, the ninth dimension. You say that animals and kids are more fifth dimensional? Or well, I think, I think all of us, think you know, particularly if, if you have a newborn around and you see, you know, the, the possibilities that are, you know... <laughs> Uh, just circling around that that infant, uh, you know, particularly within the first few months, and and I say that right now as a brand new grandpa. Uh, <gasps> oh, I, congratulations! <laughs> you know, you know what? So I, I, don't I, they they glow when they're they're asleep? There's like a you can see the aura. Absolutely, of that's, that's it's amazing. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I think I think everybody is sensitive to to what is magical about a about a child, and uh, you know, uh, as as we grow, some of that magic wears away, and part of it uh, should always still be there, but, uh, you know, experience and, and uh, input from others teaches us to, to abandon some of that stuff, you know, throughout our childhood. What qualities or activities orient us towards the fifth dimension? Well, again, you know, I, I don't want to... Uh, 
sound like I'm pandering, but I think that's where you're right on the money with with your work, Kelly. Because uh, I think uh, meditation is one of the one of the great ways that people can connect themselves to a, a higher version of themselves. And I think you're to be applauded for uh, the great work you've done to promote those ideas. Oh, thank you. I feel that it's easier for people now if they just start accessing those uh, quiet places within themselves. It's easier to feel the other dimensions. Yep. Maybe it's because I'm older. I don't know, but um, uh, you, you've probably been talking to a lot of people. Do you think it's different now that people are actually sensing a veil lifting that we we have more access to these higher dimensions i feel like um yeah definitely when when i came up with this project four years ago there was a there was a real uh, embracing that happened uh right initially an awful lot of people uh uh and some people you know that that were quite influential like um uh the fellow that uh, that invented babel fish the uh the Universal Translating Program uh, published a blog entry about it just a few days uh, afterwards and said, "This is it. This is the real thing." Uh, and so there was there is this really joyous response that happened right at the the start. And then over the next four months or so, uh, there were these people that started to come out of the woodwork saying, "This is all bunk. This is horrible. This needs to be suppressed. This is dangerous information." And again, I think that's part of what's been happening for. The, since 1919, there's this there's this real drive to try to uh, to have people not feel like their possibilities are as open as they are. So, you know, to I guess I'm giving you a long answer to your question. I feel like yes, there is definitely a, a real growth that has been happening over the last four years from from that initial little spike. Then over the last four years, I I hear from more people every day saying thank you very much. You blew my mind. You lifted the veil. You know, as you say, the uh, uh, I feel like what you're talking about is the real deal. And yes. uh, I hear from a lot of uh, teachers, too, who use this in, in classrooms uh, and uh, as just a starting point for discussion. And they say it, it opens kids up. It, it sort of frees their mind and gets them talking about things that you would never be able to broach as topics in a classroom, but kids, once they watch this video, they go, yeah, now I'm ready to talk about this stuff. Let's talk about the big picture ideas of, of what's really happening and how we're all connected to each other. I found you because of my son, who always, children are just naturally interested in time travel and the other dimensions. They're just so much more open. Yep. So, well, uh, How old is your son? He's 20, but when he was little, he was always interested in it. He, he would have long, very complicated conversations with me about time travel. He was always theorizing about it. Right on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I, I just feel that that veil is lifting. Perhaps it's because more and more people are waking up and becoming more conscious and aware and, and, uh, and bored with the third dimension. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot to be said for, for uh, that side of it. And I think we're also seeing some real desperation happening from the opposing forces that would like us not to see that. You know, some of the, the just, you know, really kind of stunningly uh, uh, out there sort of uh, information that some people are trying to promote now to, uh, to scare people, to get them to back into a fearful mindset, you know, I, uh, to make them suspicious of what's happening around them. Uh, there's so much of that in the media right now that uh, that is is kind of the the balancing point to what what you and I are talking about. This idea that there's a a growing an awareness of awareness. There's an enlightenment that's happening, and then yes. there's you know on the opposing team there's there's they're they're going for broke right now. They they don't want this information out there. They they are pushing very hard. Hey yep. Rob, what's your website? We're coming to the end of the show here. Oh, I want really? people to go to your website and see your video and read your blog. If you go to tenthdimension.com, that's sort of your gateway to it. Uh, tenthdimension.com slash blog is also a, a good place to uh, to see the stuff. And uh, youtube.com slash tenthdim one zero t h d i m uh, I've got hundreds of videos up on YouTube that talk about all the, the ideas that we're talking about in this 
this project. Thanks, Rob, for being on the show. And what a pleasure, Kelly. Thank you. Oh, it's great. We'll be talking. We'll be talking. Once again, Rob's website is 10thdimension.com. I want to thank everyone who called in and listened live online. A special shout out to Mark J. in Seattle, who heard the show on the radio and posted on my Facebook page. There are lots of ways we can stay in touch. I've got a Kelly Health Facebook fan page which I read and comment on regularly. I love to hear from you all and see your beautiful faces. I'd also like to invite you to post your comments and feedback on my website, brainsync.com. Tomorrow, this show will be posted in the Theater of the Mind section on the website. And if you were unable to get through today, you can leave your questions there too, and I'm hoping that Rob might pop in to answer you. And, uh, oh yeah, on my website, you can get a free guided meditation download and a 15 minute brain refresher. And while you're there, you can sign up for podcast notifications and find out who's coming on the radio show ahead of time. For all my podcast listeners, you can now also hear this show from anywhere in the world, live online at contacttalkradio.com. Hey everybody, thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be well. You have been listening to Theater of the Mind cast, accelerating the evolution of human consciousness. Visit Theater of the Mind online at www.kellyhowell.com. Leave comments, questions, and feedback and join the conversation about consciousness. We want to know what you're thinking. Theater of the Mind podcast is brought to you by Brainsync.com. CDs and MP3 downloads for peak performance. Find them at www.brainsync.com.